with a non-Christian faith any agreement over the non over the essentials mm. that is hypocrisy that is a pretense for example a Christian organization cannot say we are in bed a hundred percent with a non-Christian organization yes you can agree as citizens of Uganda we have a shared as citizens mm. but when it comes to matters of faith you are selective mm. you you cannot work together unless you agree so if you disagree over certain basic principles doctrinal religious any semblance of uh, unity mm. ah that is a pretending <laughs> that is a pretense and uh, <laughs> yes the, but within the christian fraternity mm. you forge as much as possible with those who name christ mm. who are indwelt by the holy spirit mm -hmm. you forge unity mm. but with the outsiders the common denominator is maybe a citizens or you are clansmen or mm. you are but you fundamentally differ over what you believe in for example you can't call yourself brothers because you have different parents you can't call yourselves you have the same destiny no you don't mm -hmm. hey but uh, so much as we agree or we should agree with those who are within the fraternity mm -hmm. we need to be honest mm -hmm. how we relate with those who are outside well, that was so doctrinal and <laughs> philosophical, <laughs> and you need the Holy Spirit to understand canon very well. But I'll leave it at that. Now, in these 60 years, uh, uh, Amos, let's yes. look at the influence of money okay. and the board of Christ, more so, uh, particularly now, the Anglican Church. This has been a big threat yes. to the body of Christ. Now, 61 years, how has the church been able to shrive yeah, there was someone who was telling me uh, that today the church needs money than never before. <laughs> Correct. And at some times the church has been uh, criticized that even when you look at what society, and I want to say this, sees as the corrupt, I mean in courts because they have not been convicted by a competent court, it's societal judgment. These are the ones that are given front seats that uh, take special recognition. Uh, you find a man of God says, join me, welcome, and recognize, mm -hmm. so and so. Then if you're building a church, they give the biggest yes. over to you. Uh, it's a little bit historical, but mm -hmm. let's begin in 1900, when the British and the, the local people here agreed that they register the, the land. Mm. So when the entire land was registered, the then native Anglican church received free 40 square miles. And they added another 12 in a few, year, uh, a few years later. So that became a total of 52 square miles. A square mile is 640 acres. That was a lot of land, and that is wealth. So that's where the church wealth and money began. We were free to sell or to lease. And uh, when we got independence, it became tricky. Uh, because after Brown left, mm. uh, the first native archbishop found himself in trouble. That much of this registered land, the 652 acres, were actually not all over Uganda. They were just here in Buganda, central region. And uh, he was the bishop of Toro. Uh, Bunyoro and Imboga. He had been appointed to become the Archbishop of the world of Uganda. Mm. And for example, he had nowhere to stay. So the automatic thing was that uh, he had to stay at Namirembe, the headquarters of mm. uh, uh, the province. And uh, the people there told him that, uh -uh, you are the Bishop of Toro, so you can go back to Toro, and when there is a faction, you can drive in, stay in a hotel, and then go back to Toro. Mm. And he was like, come on, guys. Mm. <laughs> do that. I need some a place here. So they told him, never, never, you won't. And so from 1966 all the way to 1970, there was an expert called, a civil servant actually, called John B. Kangaga. Mm. 
he was given the responsibility to carry out a financial survey mm -hmm. and administration of the Church of Uganda. He did his job. Mm -hmm. And in 1969, the report was ready. So the church was able to see its entire wealth, not only central region, but across the whole of Uganda. Mm -hmm. And then he came up with a report. And the best strategy was, first of all, to remove the archbishop from Toro. He had by then got an assistant bishop there uh, so that he could reside in central area and uh, he could have a jurisdiction over diocese. So they had to create a small diocese around the central region, which we now call the Diocese of Kampala. Mm. However, again, the people of that diocese, because the constitution, the church constitution of 61, uh, had required the local diocese to give permission for such a creation, and the permission was not given. And actually, it took Idi Amin in 1971 uh, to ask what was going on. But maybe before that, uh, the day Amin took over power was a Monday, January 25th of January 1971. It was a Monday. So when he released the detainees, there was a thanksgiving service at Namirembe the following Sunday. And uh, the people of the central region tried to show the world that, hey, hey, all that mean has taken over. We have a problem with our finances and administration here. So we are not going to allow the archbishop to be part of this. And yet the diocesan bishop had actually invited him to preach at that service. So what happened? The people of that cathedral closed it. This was on the 31st of January, 1971. It was a Sunday. They closed the cathedral. He couldn't go to the service. Idi Amin asked, what happened? But oh, I was locked out. Then Idi Amin said, you wait a minute. I will now come with you next Sunday. Repeat the thanksgiving service. So the thanksgiving service was repeated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that Idi Amin came. And the archbishop actually preached. The following year, and I must say, let me use my language. This was at gunpoint. The local diocese and the province were told that you must agree at gunpoint. And the smaller diocese was created. And properties were shared out on Namirembe Hill. What belongs to the province? What belongs to the local diocese? And now that's when people relaxed and concentrated on what belonged to what and how they could grow that wealth in terms of leases mm. to property, blah, 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 blah. So the biggest wealth of our church is actually leases. To pro of, of property of this uh, huge land that we got in 1900. And it's on those properties that we've been able to put infrastructure, like the mm. church house, although it has taken us long. Mm. Now we have even put up another modern infrastructure, the Uganda Matters Museum at Namugongo. And it's just the beginning, it's phase one. There will be phase two, which will be, who I don't know. Mm. But all that will be income generating. Expect things like flyovers, expect things like train tubes to take tourists to Namugongo. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Yeah. Of course. He's a very interesting of course, uh, uh, character uh, with very much history uh, regarding yeah. the Anglican Church. Well, I can't believe how fast time is flying. They are the principal, uh, of course. Uh, uh, listening to all this interesting history that if you didn't know. Now, uh, I want to come back to you. Uh, Bishop, Reverend Canon, sorry. No doubt, in the t uh, 61 years, we've had political interventions. Leave alone the matters, uh, the janandum, but you want to see how politics has influenced uh, the church. Today, I may not be shy to say, we've seen even bishops uh, appointed, then we've seen uh, council, we've seen postponement, and as the media, we've tried to put some things showing that there is politics. This is not only about religion and God's calling, but there is a political <laughs> tune somewhere within the Anglican Church. To you, Reverend Kanu. Well, it's very interesting. The, the, the issue of money, while the gospel is free, <laughs> it's propagation and conservation mm. of the fruit costs resources. Mm. Resources in terms of space, land, sources in terms of money uh, and men. So that is the church militant, which is the church in the world. Now, politics and uh, 
the, the church, as I said earlier, is also a human organization. Mm. And as a human organization, it should have laws that govern the membership systems of government and policies. And uh, the Church of Uganda currently is over 10 million in membership. This is a huge organization. Mm -hmm. So inevitably, the way you arrange the affairs of this church and lead, it is political in a sense. Mm. We, are running a, we are running an economy. Some of the African countries' population are much less than the population Archbishop Kazima leads. Mm. So we are talking about an economy, we are talking about the government. We have institutions, we are leading schools and, and hospitals, income generating. We are thinking of beginning a bank and operating a bank. So you really we are talking about using systems and capacities and competencies that run huge organizations. Politics comes in inevitably. Who mm -hmm. does what? And the selection process and uh, policies that govern accountability structures and systems. Mm -hmm. So it is a complex, a complex uh, situation that we have. Inevitably, carnality also comes in. The church is still here fighting the world, the devil, and the flesh. Mothers of the flesh still come in. These saints are still work in progress. They are not yet there. They are, yes, they are progressive, but they are still sinners. Yes, so the flesh catches up with us occasionally. Selfishness and greed, all those are part and parcel of a human discipleship. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> overall, we hope for the best. We pray we learn from our mistakes and that we allow the work of the Spirit of God who sanctifies the church to continue sanctifying the church and making it more perfect, conforming it to the image of Christ. But we are not yet.